When I originally published this video for you about why the Philippines is standing up to China, it was slapped with an age restriction and demonetized by YouTube, censoring it so no one was able to view it. Frustrating, yes, but on the bright side, it gave me an opportunity to remake it and address all the pro-China comments left in the original version. On February 2nd, 2023, major news was announced. The Philippines had agreed to allow the US military to create four new military bases on their island, or sites, or camps, or whatever you want to call them. In this video, we'll try to examine their strategic importance, military power, and economic reach that has given this nation an outsized role in global affairs over the past century. These strategic locations will give the US the best seats in the house to recon that South China Sea. The Philippines is made up of over 7,000 different islands located just 420 miles south of China, making it a strategically important archipelago. They've been on the front lines in the World War II, the Old War on Terror, and now the West's new competition with China. But getting to this new base agreement wasn't easy, and at one point recently it even looked like the Philippines might sever their relationship with the United States completely and join forces with China under their last president, Rodrigo Duterte. One of the main reasons for their geopolitical importance is their close proximity to the South China Sea, where an estimated $3.4 trillion in global trade annually traverses. And you could see here, the maritime shipping lane that much of this trade goes through is a tiny choke point of 250 miles between the Philippine Islands and Taiwan. Control of this sea gives a country significant economic and military leverage because it allows them to regulate the flow of ships and cargo and potentially control access to valuable resources. Due to this, we've seen both the United States and China seek to influence the Philippines. Authoritarian Chinese Communist China predictably criticized the agreement. Its embassy said in a statement, quote, US actions escalate regional tension and undermine regional peace and stability. The United States, out of its self-interest and zero-sum game mentality, continues to step up military posture in this region. Maybe the giant Chinese spy balloon slowly and awkwardly floating over the northwestern part of the United States was China saying, look, we can recon you too. It's difficult to wake up someone who is pretending to be asleep. Filipino proverb. But what's the big deal? The US has bases everywhere, right? Well, not exactly. Before this deal, the Philippines was the missing strategic link, a major gap in the US alliance security arc that went all the way from Japan to South Korea and Australia. Notably, the location of two of these new sites are in the Cagayan province near the northern tip of Luzon Island, which is across the sea border from Taiwan. The other new American bases will be located in the Philippines' western coast in the province of Palawan and Zambales, which look out over the disputed South China Sea. The Philippine island of Palawan is particularly important because of recon. Advanced American ground and air-based radar systems will be installed there, giving the U.S. the close proximity necessary to perform reconnaissance missions over a strategically important region. Ground-launched missiles could strike any naval ships with increased accuracy now. Hey man, where'd you get stationed? I got Fort Drum, upstate New York. I'm in the Philippines, but your assignment's cool too. Do you want to trade? No thanks, bye! However, the return of the American military to the Philippines was in question until just a few years ago. In fact, their former president, Rodrigo Duterte, visited Beijing, China and said, quote, and maybe I will go to Russia and talk to President Vladimir Putin and tell him that there are three of us against the world. China, Philippines, and Russia. It's the only way. So why is the Philippines' new president, Marcos, reversing this decision? By itself, the Philippines cannot stand up to China. It needs the assistance of the United States in order to do so. The deal will likely help their economy. The United States has already invested more than $82 million in an existing base infrastructure there, and the majority of those contracts support local Philippine companies. This is in stark contrast to how China does business, where they bring in their own labor and companies. The new bases will also allow for faster humanitarian aid if there's some kind of climate-related disaster that occurs in the region. Unverified Bear 1885 commented a counterpoint with a pro-China perspective on the original version of this video saying, quote, China is increasing its hostility, meanwhile, the implication that this commenter is making here is that the United States are the ones who are being hypocritical for saying China's increasing hostility in the region, while at the same time adding new military bases extremely close to China. But another commenter explained the flaws in this logic by saying, quote, 
except it was the Philippines that made the decision to allow us there. So why did the Philippines allow these new American bases there? What's at stake for them? With a population of 113.9 million people and a size of roughly 300,000 square miles, the Philippines is about the same size as Italy. The country is such a beautiful looking beach paradise that you can kind of understand why everyone from Spain to the United States has tried to own it at one point. Their economic significance comes in part thanks to their abundance of metal and mineral deposits. Seriously, geologists would go nuts for this shit. Volcanic activity in the Pacific Rim of Fire, as it's called, created the Philippine island itself in the first place, but it also resulted in the formation of important metallic minerals of gold, copper, iron, chromite, nickel, cobalt, and platinum. Why are these metals so important? Because they're required for the world's new clean energy production technologies and are in very high demand right now. They're vital for the world's construction, manufacturing, and energy sectors, and so they make up an estimated 19% of the Philippines' total wealth and are a major contributor to their GDP. Speaking of GDP, their growth has absolutely exploded since 2000, from 83 billion to 394 billion in 2021. But I think they may have missed an opportunity to invest some of those increased funds into their armed forces during this time, which could have helped them with some of their difficult security problems that we're gonna get into. But before we get into that, this video and its animations were only possible thanks to our partner, Husk. Husk is one Japanese-inspired steel knife that you'll wanna to add to your own personal arsenal. It's made from high-quality Japanese steel and features an oak wood, dark texture, rustic-style handle with a 38-degree blade edge. They're offering 70% off to you guys, so click the link in the description to take advantage. Cooking is my main hobby outside the military, so I was very excited when Husk sent me their extremely sharp blade to replace my old dull kitchen knives that barely work. It made chopping through tough meat and veggies a breeze with its lightweight and durable build. Its heavy duty stainless Japanese steel was also forged with nature in mind. Add the husk knife to your everyday carry to always be prepared if you need to cut ropes or prepare food while out camping. Trying out husk is completely risk free to you because they assure a 30 day money back guarantee. Currently for all you guys in the spare parts army, husk is running a 70% discount on their authentic Japanese inspired knives. The deal won't last long though, so make sure to try it out by clicking my special link in the bio. As a share of their total GDP, the Philippines defense spending has trended down over the same time period. Their defense spending is at $3.7 billion annually, which is 1.01% of their total GDP. Since 2014, China has built 10 artificial island bases, most notably one at Mischief Reef, which is deep inside the Philippines' own exclusive economic zone and is aptly named Mischief Reef. In 2013, the Philippines filed a case before the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which ruled in 2016 that China's claims to this historic rights within the Nine Dash Line were without legal basis. This ruling was promptly rejected by China and seriously hurt relations between these two countries since then. This is where their partner, the United States, comes in. Washington provides a shield against the assertiveness of authoritarian China, and the Philippines in return provides them with a foothold in Asia. If I were to steel man the argument from the Chinese perspective, they feel they're fighting to have control of the waterways right off their own shores. From China's perspective, they're investing a lot of money into infrastructure programs in the region, and since they have a vested interest, they should have more say in the security and control of this area. But sovereignty and independence from foreign influence is a key component to understanding the Filipinos' perspective. A person who does not remember where they came from will never reach their destination. Part of what makes the Philippines not beholden to foreign superpowers is their membership in the Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, which is a regional intergovernmental organization made up of 10 countries that promotes economic, political, and security cooperation among its member states. The bloc has struggled with being effective, though, and has had trouble with developing a unified approach in response to territorial disputes with China in the South China Sea and responding to Myanmar's civil war. These are the same problems that came up against the Pacific Pact nearly 50 years ago. The Philippine Navy is charged with protecting these disputed waterways. They have an estimated strength of 24,500 active service personnel, including an 8,300 strong Philippine Marine Corps. They operate 82 combat vessels. Since 1965, the Philippines has embarked on a program to modernize the armed forces. The Philippines has a military that is about 155,000 people strong. So what is your average infantryman in the Philippines like? They fight under the motto, protecting the people, securing the state. 
Roughly 8 in 10 or 78% of Filipinos have a positive view of the United States compared to 55% for China. So your average soldier in the Philippines likely leans towards the West. One of the most interesting things to note about their armed forces is that they use mainly Western NATO equipment. The Philippines location makes it a key player in the fight against terrorism. The country has been used as a base for two main terrorist organization groups, including the Abu Sarif group. In 2022, Washington deployed special forces groups to train and advise Philippine units fighting Abu Sharif militants in a program that once involved 1,200 Americans on the ground, which a small presence of which still reportedly remains for logistics and technical support. They've clashed in significant battles starting on May 17th, culminating in the Battle of Mari, where American special forces and intelligence aircraft assets were used to help the battle against the insurgents. Terrorist incidents declined by 26% since 2018. Islam first arrived in the Philippines in the late 14th century when Arab merchants arrived through Southeast Asian trade networks. Today, around 5% of the population is Muslim and mostly located in the south of the country. The Philippines' volcanic origin makes the interior of the country very mountainous, with several mountain peaks reaching almost 10,000 feet. This has to be taken into consideration when acquiring armored vehicles. The heavy main battle tanks that lend themselves to combat in the Middle East and Europe would not perform as well in the terrain encountered by the Philippine army. They have instead focused on upgrading to their M113s into light tanks with cannons that have seen very heavy combat against the extremist insurgency. A country without freedom is like a prisoner with shackled hands. Authoritarianism and foreign influence are concepts that the Philippines has struggled against firsthand for longer than you might think. For over 300 years, the Philippines was a Spanish colony, and that's actually where they get their name, King Philip II of Spain. So just add, add Philippine to the end of your name and you could understand what, what it would be if it was named after you. The Americans came around and helped them kick out the Spanish. And in doing so, the nation technically gained their independence on June 12, 1898. But right afterwards, America ended up deciding that they would take control of the islands for themselves and with the Treaty of Paris in December of 1898. Over the next three years, there was a failed Philippine insurrection against the United States, aiming to once again achieve true independence. The period of American colonization of the Philippines lasted for 48 years, directly following Spanish rule. America at the time believed that they didn't occupy the Philippines, then Japan would take over. But their battle with autocracy continued. Ferdinand Marcos was the 10th elected president of the Philippines in 1965, but he wasn't cool with the idea of not being president forever. He used civil unrest in the country to declare martial law in 1972, using the Philippines military and authority to suppress and abolish the freedom of speech, freedom of press, and other civil liberties. 70,000 were detained, 35,000 were tortured, and 3,200 were KIA during this time, and it's considered a dark spot on their history. It could help explain why the Philippines has had a reluctance to grow their defense spending today. There could still be a stigma from this period of martial law. Marcos sent the economy into a nosedive, and his corruption was forever galvanized by his first lady Emilita's famous collection of 3,000 shoes, which is 2,999 more pairs than I own. President Nixon, Carter, and Reagan supported Marcos as part of the 1951 Mutual Defense Treaty. Marcos helped the United States maintain its security interests in Southeast Asia, and in return, Marcos received military aid. Remember, at this time in the 1980s, the US had 15,000 troops stationed in the Philippines, similar to how they have in Japan. But eventually, he became too great a liability. It wasn't until 1986 when the People Power Revolution displaced Ferdinand Marcos that they would transition from an authoritarian form of rule to democracy. These protesters flooded the streets in Manila to protest Marcos and his attempt to steal the election. Marcos fled to Hawaii thanks to the US Air Force transportation plane. In 1992, the Philippines had enough of foreign military powers on their soil. And with the end of the Cold War, the 15,000 US military personnel left the island for good. Today, the leader only holds a single term of six years. We'll soon see how the Marcos family will come back today to play an important role in choosing whether or not to partner with the United States or China. The definition of independence for the Philippines means that their highest office in their country is the Philippine head of state, not the American president or the Chinese dictator that tries to influence them with weapons or infrastructure grants. Evidence that they do have independence today comes from the fact that they are able to successfully play both sides to their own advantage. 
If someone throws a rock at you, throw them bread. The US Department of State has done their part in trying to coax the nation into siding with them. They provided the Philippines with over 463 million in security assistance since 2015. Now, these numbers don't even include the donated military equipment from the US. The United States and the Philippines maintain close security ties and frequently conduct joint military exercises to enhance interoperability. Three separate agreements form the foundation of their security agreements with the West. The 1951 US-Philippine Mutual Defense Treaty, the 2014 Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement that allows the US to rotate troops to a total of nine bases throughout the nation, and the 1998 Visiting Forces Agreement that prevents US troops from being arrested and tried in the Philippines court system. On the other hand, China has traded less so in the security department and more so in their economics. In early 2023, the Philippines secured new loans from China totaling $200 million with another $218 million available for future projects. These funds are meant to bankroll key infrastructure projects like bridges and flood control systems. The last prior president of the Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte, from 2016 to 2022, Duterte chose to prioritize closer relations with China and Russia. During his time in charge of the country, Duterte threatened to sever ties with Washington, which goes to show just how big of an impact a leader can have on world affairs, even of a small country. The citizens in the Philippines, who are against stronger ties with the United States, feel there is a long history of inequality in this relationship, including many crimes that US soldiers committed against their people while stationed there. And they felt former President Duterte was trying to get them a more fair deal. Early in 2023, the Philippines' new president, Marcos, who's the son of the dictator that I mentioned earlier, took a completely different approach. At first, people were worried that he would shun the United States and ally with China also, but that really hasn't been the case. When Marcos' family fled to exile in Hawaii, millions of Filipinos rejoiced and threw a big old party, but three decades later, they literally elected the dictator's son as president. This was a major concern because the US-Philippines alliance is vital to both nations' security and prosperity, especially in the new era of competition with China. Marcos led re-engagement with the US though, and he agreed for the new four bases in the Philippines. Prior to this agreement, the US had no active bases and only sent 500 troops on a rotational training basis. I have to give credit where credit is due. President Joe Biden has successfully re-engaged with the Filipino president, Marcos. This is a win for US national security. Marcos has tried to keep the peace with China also. He agreed to set up direct lines of communication channels between their foreign ministers on the South China Sea to handle any disputes peacefully, as well as increasing business and economic ties with China. Now, it's important to keep in mind, the Philippines' human rights record has been a constant struggle for the country. They're rated as partly free by the Freedom House Index. The rule of law and application of justice are reportedly haphazard and heavily favor political and economic elites. Democratic institutions that provide oversight and accountability are rated as either weak or undermined. Violent crimes against activists and journalists happen with impunity, according to the Freedom House Index. Their former president, Duterte, seemed to take the idea of independence from any influence of foreign powers to the extreme. This concept of independence and sovereignty has been central to the story of this country's national identity, and it's an important part of understanding their perspective. A brave person will face a situation no matter how dreadful. The Philippines is one of the oldest Asian partners of the United States and a strategically major non-NATO ally. More than 4 million Filipino Americans live in the United States, and almost 300,000 US citizens reside in the Philippines. The Philippines today appears to be on a strong path towards supporting their own security and that of Taiwan and the United States. This is, of course, my biased Western opinion, and I'm open to hearing your thoughts in the comments. If you found this video valuable in some way, please hit the like button. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy, over and out.